It is a game that has been passed down from father to son to grandson. Many a warm summer evening has been spent on the front porch. Three generations, age 8 to 68, talking, reminiscing about the plays, the players, and the games. It is a game that has endured the Great Depression and World War II and other hot and cold wars. It is a simple game, throw, hit, catch and run, yet it is hardly simple in its conception. The perfect dimensions, the statistics, the positions, it all fits together so seamlessly. And just as history is the story of events as shaped by individuals, baseball history is the story of events as shaped by the players. Relive some of that history with us as Greatest Sports Legends presents Baseball Memories, Myths, and Legends. Somehow people knew it's not just whites playing a game on a diamond anymore. It was a new beginning. So Babe comes up to the plate. He had two strikes on him. He steps out of the box to hold up two fingers. to think, and I said it, that to hit a baseball is the hardest single thing to do in sports. I did such great hitting in Brooklyn that uh, the fans had always used to say, uh, here comes that man, here comes that man. So uh, pretty soon it was, it was standing man. When I was a kid, my father would say to me, Babe Ruth striking out with that mighty swing was more exciting than watching somebody else happen to hit a home run. I believe that all records are made to be broken. Just like Aaron just broke Babe Ruth's record, and so many other, other records have fallen by the wayside, I believe 56 games will go as well. I've wanted to be a baseball player for as long as I can remember. The words of Joe Morgan are not unique, yet they represent the essence of what young American boys have dreamed about since 1839, when a new game was created, and it was called baseball. Take me out to the ball game. By the turn of the century, the professional game had taken on a broader appeal, thanks to players like Walter Johnson, Hannes Wagner, and the meanest man in baseball, Ty Cobb. As America entered its golden age in the 1920s, so did baseball, due in large part to two men who would forever be bonded together in the history books, Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth. If there were ever two players who captured the imagination and admiration of baseball fans everywhere, they were Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. On the field, this New York Yankee duo was a frightening sight to opposing pitchers, yet they achieved their individual greatness in very different ways. Baseball historian Shirley Povich. There was a vast difference in personalities. Babe Ruth, one of a kind, went his own merry way and everything. He was a lusty, gusty guy who uh, was uh, actually affectionate toward everybody he saw. Lou uh, Gehrig, uh, there's such a contrasting personality. He was almost shy of manner, and uh, he didn't aspire to this fame or this glory that uh, Ruth uh, always commanded. Uh, uh, he was simply Lou Gehrig, the ball player, and perfectly content in that role. The larger-than-life persona of Babe Ruth, perhaps the greatest player in baseball history, grew out of a childhood of hardship and delinquency. Living in an orphanage because he was too much to handle for his parents, Ruth was best described as an incorrigible youth. Baseball historian Roger Kahn. He never chewed tobacco until he was six. Never had a drink until he was seven. 
He stole whatever loose change was around the house on his own testimony. And Ruth said once, I was a bad kid. Ruth's life was marked by excess, whether it be his exorbitant offensive statistics or his hedonistic lifestyle away from the game. He wanted to seize the day, you know, the Latin phrase, carpe diem, seize the day, everything out of every day. The most fun, the most excitement, day off, let's go to the racetrack, let's bet 1,500 on the first three races. Ah, uh, there's a pretty lady over there. I wonder if she's free. How would she like to meet the great babe? And though he didn't live a long life, and he didn't live three score years and ten, from the time he came into his own in baseball, uh, he didn't miss very much. Hitting behind Ruth in the Yankee lineup was Gary, whose baseball presence contrasted Ruth's like night and day. While the babe sported an excessive girth, Lou looked as if he were chiseled from stone and his ball-playing exploits sometimes surpassed those of his more celebrated teammates. He hit that ball probably farther than anybody except Babe Ruth for his time period. He had that magnificent physique, and like so many power hitters, despite the fact he was a football player, he did not have the square shoulders. He had the lovely sloping shoulders that mean flexibility and batting strength and in personal appearance so there he was a handsome a friendly fellow with the deepest dimples ever seen in a masculine face despite Gehrig's outstanding athleticism and boyish charm Ruth was still the star attraction in all of baseball they've often felt his celebrity status gave him a certain level of autonomy from his teammates and even from his manager when Miller Huggins, who was a small man, perhaps 5'4", uh, who was managing the Yankees, tried to discipline Ruth on a train in the days when ball clubs traveled by train, Ruth responded to the discipline by walking to the caboose, dragging Miller along with him, and holding Miller at arm's length off the back edge of a speeding train. Uh, when Miller recovered his poise and his nerve, he fined Ruth $5,000. There's some question as to whether that was ever collected by the Yankees. But discipline Ruth and you get held off a speeding train. He knew who he was. He knew that he was Babe Ruth. He knew he put the people in the park. He knew that he was the emperor of American baseball. And if you try to say, Babe, I think you ought to go to bed a little earlier, and maybe that young lady will wait until the season is over. As I say, you'll get held off the end of a speeding train and told to go to hell. For Babe Ruth, being front page news was all part of his grandiose style, and this was never more evident than in game three of the 1932 World Series. Legend has it that the Babe called his own home run. This event, whether fact or fiction, epitomizes the legend of number three. Well, I talked to a lot of Yankees who played with him. I talked to 10 and I got 11 versions. Uh, yes, he did it. No, he didn't do it. Don't let anybody tell you that he did not point to the fence. He did. So Babe comes up to the plate. He had two strikes on him. And he steps out of the box and holds up two fingers. And with his bat in his left hand, and with him two fingers, he, he just, just like a fellow, just pointed just like that to center field. Well, on the next pitch, I got a mental picture right now. Ruth's crushing blow sailed over the center field fence for a home run. So the story goes. But did he really do it? You don't always need truth. Uh, you don't always need absolute accuracy. Let the story be. Ruth called the shot. I'm pleased with that. Well, I happened this one particular time when I went to bat. Charlie Ruth was pitching. Well, I looked out in center field and I tore it. I said, I'm going to hit the next pitch ball right past the flag. With Babe Ruth grabbing most of the attention in New York, there was little room for Lou Gehrig's accomplishments in the sports headlines. Even though Lou's Hall of Fame career often took a back seat to the performances of Ruth and later on Joe DiMaggio, baseball always held a place in her heart for the Iron Man. Uh, we know that uh, he didn't get top billing in all those years to the Yankees when Babe Ruth was there. Who could supersede Ruth? You had to be number two behind Ruth. I must say for Lou Gehrig, he never complained. But we know that 
every person at some time who wants to be a little bit eminent. Perhaps there would come another day when Gehrig would get top billing. Perhaps it would come the time when Babe Ruth retired in 1934, as Ruth did. But uh, no luck for Lou Gehrig. Along came the brilliant rookie Joe DiMaggio, 36, 37, 38, wiping out all of Lou Gehrig's, uh, well, I won't say importance, but wiping out his chances to be number one on the Yankees. Everybody was taken with DiMaggio, his speed, his bat, and his charisma, and Lou is now second fiddle to a new man on the Yankees. Well, he did get top billing that memorable day in Yankee Stadium when they brought him out to give him all of those honors and the tributes and and the thing that he wanted least, sympathy. That was Lou Gehrig's day. But came another day when Lou Gehrig died. No luck again. Unfortunately, he wasn't even the top obituary of the week. That belonged to Kaiser Wilhelm, who passed away in Holland, the world figure that he was. Lou Gehrig was topped again, not that it mattered to Lou. Lou Gehrig's baseball talents helped the Yankees win seven World Series titles. Babe Ruth's mere presence in the Yankee lineup helped popularize the game more than ever before. One player who experienced Ruth firsthand was Joe Dugan, Babe's roommate in New York for seven years. Roger Codd recalls an interview with Dugan about his former bunkmate. In a book I wrote, I sat down while jumping Joe Dugan told me. He said, to understand him, you had to understand this. He wasn't human. He was an animal. No human could have done the things he did, lived the way he did, and been that kind of ball player. Cobb, could he pitch? Speaker, the rest, I saw them. There was never anybody close. When you figure the things he did, and the way he lived and the way he played, you got to figure he was more than an animal, even. There never was anyone like him. And then, in his old man's voice, Joe Dugan said, he was a god. By the end of the 1930s, the era of Ruth and Gehrig had passed, but not before this tandem had created a level of baseball supremacy that may never be matched. They were the Babe and the Iron Man. The growing American love affair with baseball was halted slightly by the onset of World War in the 1940s. Yet no army seemed capable of halting the emergence of two of the greatest hitters baseball has ever seen, Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams. Each year, these two waged their own war against each other for batting titles and most valuable player awards. In 1941, DiMaggio of the Yankees hit in a record 56 consecutive games and was named the American League MVP. In that same year, Williams did some hitting of his own. By the last day of the season, Ted was leading the majors with a 400 average. The question was, would Williams play in the final doubleheader? I went into that last game a little bit tinged up because I, I, I wanted to hit 400 now. I really wanted to hit 400, but it never entered my mind, never once, of not playing. This is something that was really uh, unusual. I got up to the plate, and I'm all set to hit. The pitcher was taking the sign, and all of a sudden, Bill McGowan, the umpire, stopped the game momentarily, and he, he turned his back towards the pitcher, and he started wiping the plate again. Right. It was perfectly clean, but he started wiping the plate again. <laughs> and he said, bending down, he said, in order to hit 400, he says, you've got to be loose. Now, he did that for my benefit, see? Sure. And then Frankie Hayes, who was the catcher, said, we're going to pitch to you. He said, we're not going to give you anything, but he said, we're going to pitch to you. Mr. Max said to pitch to you. Red Sox and A's in a doubleheader here at Chai Park in Philadelphia. But all eyes are on this man, Ted Williams, gunning for a 400 season. He's hitting an even 400. I think if I were Ted, I would sit out today, but Ted never backed into anything. Dick Fowler, the pitcher for the Philadelphia A's. Here's the pitch to Williams. Line drive, base hit. Ted Williams has a hit in his first at bat. Ted now three for four. First game of the double bill. The pitch to him, long drive, deep right field. This ball is out of here. Ted Williams.
Williams, four for five in game one, is still going to play the second one. Second game of the doubleheader. Williams, a line drive, blue darter. It hits the horn in right field, and Ted has himself a double. Ted finishes the doubleheader six for eight, batting 406. Not too bad a day. In 1947, DiMaggio and Williams were at it again. This time, Joe led the Yankees to a World Series title, while Ted won the Triple Crown, leading all hitters in home runs, RBIs, and batting average. In a controversial vote for MVP, DiMaggio won out by just one point, but Williams was gracious in defeat. There was a Boston writer uh, who I had had an argument with that summer, and um, he failed to give me a 10th place vote, and a 10th place vote would have given me two, two points. I always felt that, to some degree, it wasn't fair. But I have to say this, that uh, uh, I only lost out by one point, and I lost out to the greatest player I ever saw, Joe DiMaggio. During his career, Ted had an on-again, off-again relationship with the press and the fans, as opposed to his Yankee rival, who was one of the most popular athletes of his time. One night in Fenway Park, the Red Sox faithful took an opportunity to show their slugger what they really thought of him. I uh, provoked a little ill feeling uh, on a couple occasions when uh, I made... Uh, some nasty gestures because I was all fired up and the press had uh, really lay it on me. Right, right. In fact, they even went so far, some of them, to say is that I ought to quit. And uh, it just so happened that they had their first family night in Boston. Of course, uh, there was a lot of press there and they were all gonna see just how uh, old Ted was gonna get crucified right there at home plate. And I wanna tell you, they in mass rose and they gave me one of the greatest ovations I ever had. I realized then that, uh, that the baseball fans of New England were really for Ted Williams, and that uh, I, I felt that way all the rest of my days. Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio were superstars of their era, yet one common thread linked them with every major league player before them. They were white. Black ball players had organized their own professional leagues at the turn of the 20th century. Despite poor playing conditions, the so-called Negro Leagues produced such talent as Josh Gibson, often referred to as the Black Bay Root, and Satchel Paige, who was known as much for his wry wit as he was for his baffling array of pitches. For these and other black athletes of the time, racial segregation was par for the course, both on and off the field. In 1947, that all changed. Branch Rickey, general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, seeking to integrate baseball, signed Jackie Robinson, a black man, to a major league contract. Legendary broadcaster Howard Cosell recalls Robinson's first game as a Dodger. Brooklyn achieved its greatest fulfillment as a borough, as a city of its own, beginning on that April day in 1947, when in the words of Roger Kahn, a very gifted literateur, Everything was white, and only the grass was green. Except suddenly, there was a figure. Black, I mean jet black. Clearly, a little bit frightened. It was a day when somehow people knew, thoughtful people, educated people, hey, it's not just whites playing a game on a diamond anymore. It was a new beginning, and a man named Ricky had created it. Robinson's entrance into the major leagues was not a welcome event for everyone. Some of Jackie's own teammates were openly opposed to his arrival, and it took some quick thinking on the part of Dodger manager Leo DeRocher to keep peace in the Brooklyn clubhouse. I heard some whispering going on that had a petition up that Robinson was coming on the club, but they were not going to play with Robinson. So I woke him up. I couldn't sleep. And I got him all downstairs. And I said, I don't know about any petition, but they tell me you got one up. And I don't know about any petition, but I'll tell you what you can do with it. Because Robinson's going to play on this ball club. Because I don't look at the color. I don't care if he's green, black, yellow, white. He has talent. And he will put money in your pocket and my pocket. This is some kind of player. And he's going to be here. And I'm warning you now that he's only the first of many to follow. Remember what I tell you right now in this meeting. He's only the first. 
Robinson wasn't the only black who struggled for acceptance in baseball. The great Willie Mays remembers his own difficulties as a black ball player. We had to make bus trips. And now, you know, when you go in those small towns and you, you really have a saying, hey, you can't eat here, but you can play here. Mm -hmm. So we had those kind of things thrown up against me. And a lot of times I was kind of upset. But then I said to myself, this is where I want to be. And I must shine right now because I don't think I'll have another chance. Jackie Robinson's effect on sports and American society was felt almost immediately. He became a hero to young blacks who wanted to play in the majors, and an Alabama youngster named Henry Aaron heeded his every word. I can remember uh, going to the auditorium, listening to my idol, Jackie Robinson. And uh, at that time, there were no blacks in baseball. Jackie was playing with Montreal. And uh, the next year, of course, he came up to the big leagues. But, uh, I can remember, you know, just hoping and wishing that uh, one day that I would be able to have a chance to, to start in professional baseball, to have a chance to play professional baseball. And, of course, Jackie Robinson gave us all our start. Robinson's pioneering efforts gave hope to boys like Willie Stargell, who dreamed of nothing but baseball while growing up in the projects. When I was in the projects, I uh, used to go down to the lumber mill at the end of the projects and get some of the scrap wood and whittle it in the form of a bat and take rocks and hit them over the car boxes that was lined up along the railroad tracks. And the people in the projects would uh, confront me as to what I was doing. And I was telling them that I was visualizing hitting home runs in ballparks in the major leagues. And they said, now wait a minute, you know, black kid from the projects playing major league baseball, you're crazy. Well, that was my desire, that was my dream. I mean, I could go to bed at night tasting it and feeling it and, and actually seeing the involvement itself. And when I was asked if I wanted to consider to play professional baseball, and then they gave me $1,500. I said, wow, these people are crazy. The emergence of black players in the majors opened the door for other minorities, particularly Latin ball players. One of the first was Roberto Clemente of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Clemente had strong ties to his Puerto Rican homeland and often credited the support of his Latin fans for his baseball success. Stargell, Clemente's former teammate, remembers Roberto's reaction to his 3,000th career hit. I saw a certain glow in his eye that I'd never seen before. And it was almost like, well, I was put here to accomplish this one particular thing because I think what he was doing it for, uh, there has never been a Latin to to make that achievement, and he was telling the Latin world that their accomplishment yeah. can be made. There is an avenue to success. I don't think that I had never, uh, never done this, what I had done in baseball, uh, if, if that wasn't for the fans. If, if, I, if that wasn't for the love that I have for the Puerto Rican people and for the love that I have for the people fans, we had never make it, never. Roberto Clemente and Jackie Robinson, two men who epitomized the spirit and pride of their heritage, both on and off the field. One man who has witnessed many of the great baseball moments of this century is Leo DeRocher, nicknamed The Lip, for coining phrases like, Show me a good loser, and I'll show you an idiot. In nearly 50 years as a big league player and manager, DeRocher's short fuse and fiery personality often put him in a tight spot, a position he grew accustomed to as a kid. Science teacher. I did some remember in the, the olden days, they had these big tall windows, and they had a big long pole with a little hook on the end of it where you could open the window. And I don't know, he did something to me, and... Uh, and he brought me up to, he made me sit up front in the front seat, and I had about this much room on my knees. And he was a cranky old guy anyway, and he, he did something, man, and, and he finally leaned over because I wasn't sitting correctly or something, and he, he slapped me. <laughs> and I went in the back of the room, got the pole, and hit him over the head with it. <laughs> Broke the pole in half, and that was it. They suspended me, and I never went back. 
Along with his much storied managerial career, Leo also played shortstop in the majors, most notably with the St. Louis Cardinals famed Gas House Gang of the 1930s, a club made up of many colorful characters. I remember one day, the late Joe Medwick, Tex Carlton was in the batting cage, and when the bell rang, that meant everybody get out. The regulars now, it's our turn to hit. We got 30 minutes. And Tex Carlton was in the batting cage, and he wouldn't get out. And he's our starting pitcher that day. Medrick walked right around the cage and hit him and knocked him cold. <laughs> cold, he's laying there. First came running out, no pants on, the gates hadn't opened yet. Didn't have his pants on, nothing, just shorts, came running, what happened? Then they finally told him, well, he wouldn't get out of the cage, and Medrick flattened him. We had to have another pitcher that day. In 1936, DeRocher, playing with the Cardinals, faced a fireballing young pitcher named Bob Feller in an exhibition game. Feller, who became the top hurdler of his era, was still looking for his first big league strikeout, as well as a way to control his wildness. I threw the first one over his head, one behind him, two strikes, <laughs> and, Fr and Frankie Frisch, the manager, <laughs> saw how wild that was. He took himself out of the lineup. He wouldn't even come to bat. <laughs> well, after Rocher got the second strike on him, he ran to the, to the dugout and hid behind the water cooler. And he looked out and said, hey, kid, you can't hit me from here. Uh, but uh, Rocher came back and stood about six feet from the plate and took a swipe at one and ran back. And that was my first strikeout in my baseball career. As a player, Rocher was no better than average. But as a manager, he was a keen judge of talent. As skipper of the New York Giants in 1951, Leo stood behind a struggling but talented outfielder who wasn't sure he could hit big league pitching. With Leo's support, this rookie became one of the best all-around athletes in the game's history, Willie Mays. The first time I heard about Willie Mays, I let me look at this kid, and he was at Minneapolis. He was only hitting 477. So finally, they, they brought him up. To me, I thought I was ready. I went 0 for 5 the first day, 0 for 5 the second day. The third day, I was kind of upset. I went to the clubhouse. I was crying, and I said, hey, man, it's time for me to go back to the minor league. I don't think I can play. I feel, I feel that uh, it's got to be something wrong with me. And I went out and put my arm around him. I said, what's the matter, son? He said, Mr. Leo, Mr. Leo, I'm not good enough to play here. He said, it's too fast for me. I know you're going to send me back to Minneapolis. He said, no, I can't play up here. I said, Willie, as long as I'm the manager, you're going to be out there in center field, son. That same year, Leo watched Bobby Thompson shot her around the world that won the National League pennant for the Giants. DeRocher, who was coaching at third base at the time, also saw his life nearly flash before his eyes when an overzealous Giant fan got a little carried away during the celebration. I got trampled on, and some guy had a stranglehold on me. I thought he was a, a Dodger fan. He must have weighed 250, and he was choking me to death. And uh, finally, two cops got him off me, but he was a Giant fan mm -hmm. who had gone hysterical and gone nuts. And uh, he says, Leo, you're the greatest. And I said, yeah, but you're killing me. You're choking me. And they finally got me in the clubhouse. Despite this fan's jubilation for Leo, the lip was not one of the more popular men in the game, especially among his peers. Dodger Hall of Famer Duke Snyder remembers one giant Dodger melee when even the umpires were calling for DeRocher's head. We had a fight one time, and to show you uh, how much dislike there was for DeRocher, why uh, uh, Carl Farrell got DeRocher, and he's down on the ground with both thumbs right here. He's choking DeRocher as they go down, and all baseball fights, there's a big pileup. No fists, <laughs> no no punches thrown, but there's just I've a big pileup. Yeah, 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 yeah. So <laughs> I got there, and I'm standing at the outer limits because I, the only place you're going to get hurt is if you're in that pileup because there's biting, there's scratching, oh, yeah. everything's going on in there. So I learned to stay out of those pileups. All of a sudden, they're pulling everybody off, and right next to me is Babe Pinelli, an umpire. And he didn't get along with Leo at all. <laughs> and they're pulling him off, and they finally get to DeRocher and Ferrillo, and DeRocher is as white as a sheet. He's about to pass out, and I think it's the only time in my life that I felt sorry for Leo. And I'm looking there, and it looks like he's going to pass out at any minute, and Babe Pinelli, the umpire, standing next to me, said, Kill him, Carl, kill him. <laughs> In 1954, DeRocher won his only World Series as a manager when the Giants swept Cleveland. One of the heroes of that fall classic was Dusty Rhodes, a player who often gave Leo more trouble than he was worth. I took the club to Japan in 1953. We arrived on a Thursday. We're going to play Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Friday morning, I come down. He's in the lobby. His shirt is sticking out. His fly was half open. He looked, his hair was down. He looked like he had been out for a week. And I looked at him, I said, where the hell are you been? He said, 
I was over to see my sister. I said, you got a sister in Japan too, right? That afternoon, that afternoon, I was hoping we'd play 30 innings so I could kill him. The minute the ball game was over, I took a shower and I knock on Stoneham's door. And who opens the door but Dusty Rhodes with a drink in his hand? <laughs> I said, it's either DeRosha or Rhodes. Get him the hell off this ball club. I don't want him on this ball club, and don't you dare open the season with him. Get him off of this club. We put him on waivers for one dollar. Not another club in baseball would take him. Thank the Lord for that. Because thank, thank you know what he did for me in that World Series. Leo's reputation as the temperamental sword reached beyond American borders. In fact, his sometimes spirited approach has been seen by baseball fans worldwide. When I'm sitting on the bench and something happens, here I go. Well, we're over there in Japan, and only an exhibition game, but a little short Japanese umpire at third base, and he missed the play a, a yard and a half and called the man safe, and of course, I left the bench, forgot myself, and I left the bench, and I said, you where were you looking? And I ran him about 30 feet down the left field line. He kept backing up looking at me, and I turned around, and Henry Thompson, uh, my third baseman, uh, was laughing. And I said, what are you laughing at? I'll wrap you one in the mouth. He said, Leo, he can't speak English. He doesn't know what you're doing. <laughs> now in Cuba, uh, with Wyatt pitching an exhibition game, Batista was up there with McPhail. And a guy bunted a ball, and it went between first base and my pitcher, but it was almost at the pitcher. And the guy ran from, instead of running down the line, he almost stepped into my pitcher's glove, picking up the ball. And I said to my interpreter, and he called him safe. Call him safe. And I said, go tell him. I said, and I use language. He said, I can't do that. I said, yeah, go ahead and do it. Do as I tell you. So he went up there and did it. And the umpire took the mask off and started to hit me with it. <laughs> and I started to hit him. And naturally, here they come. Three policemen and three soldiers with the bayonets. And they got me circled. And they escorted me 600 feet down the left field line. And what do you think Batista said to McPhail? That was a great show. Have him do it again tomorrow. He thought I was kidding. I wasn't kidding. I was mad. The 1950s were a successful time for DeRocher and his Giants, as it was for the other two teams occupying the city of New York at the time, the New York Yankees and the Brooklyn Dodgers. City, the Big Apple. No other town has experienced as much baseball excitement as New York did during the fabulous 50s. Leo DeRocher's Giants brought home two pennants and a World Series title to the polo grounds. The Dodgers captured four National League crowns and a World Championship. But any team's achievements during this decade pale in comparison to the dominance of the Bronx Bombers, the New York Yankees. The Yanks competed in eight World Series in the 1950s and won six. Players like Joe DiMaggio, Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra, and Whitey Ford graced their lineups. And six times a Yankee was named the American League's most valuable player during this period. The man who orchestrated each and every one of these Yankee teams was Casey Stengel. Along with his triumphs as a Yankee skipper, Casey is also remembered for his fun-loving approach to the game. Here are a few of Stengel's associates with stories of the old professor. First, Warren Spahn, who played under Casey with the Boston Braves. I came up from the minor leagues and, uh, you know, just out of World War II and really gung-ho about pitching and whatever. And the Brooklyn Dodgers used to beat our brains out. And we were playing in Boston one day and we finally realized that the man on second base was giving or relaying the signs of the hitter. And uh, we were using like one for the fastball, two for the curveball. So Pee Wee Reese was hitting and the runner on second base saw the sign and he related to the hitter, except that we reversed the signs. And it was supposed to have been a breaking ball and Pee Wee was looking breaking ball and I had orders to knock him down. And when I threw, I threw behind him and Pee Wee just ducked it. And Casey was our manager, and he jumped up, and he hit his head on the top of the dugout, and he was all upset with me. And he gave me the knockdown sign again. And this time, I came up in here and didn't really knock Pee Wee down. 
So Casey came out to the mound. He said, young man, he said, you're going to have to learn to get some guts. And he sent me to Hartford <laughs> on minor league ball club. And he really did. Casey was a funny, funny man. But he knew baseball. And he had his own way of doing things. He was a, he was a great manager. But he had that personality to go along with it. He double-talked me into a contract, and I didn't know whether I signed or not. Now we got this guy over here in right field. We got a little kid named Mantle. He said, you go out and mount. He said, I'll make the double play for you. But before I knew it, I'm signing. I took a $12,000 cut and didn't even know it. It was a game Vic Rashi was pitching. Uh, Casey let him in. Uh, they feel like he let him in too long. He got hit, and uh, he gets a telegram from a kid from uh, Fort Mountain, New Jersey. So how, how stupid can you be leaving Vic Rashi in that long? And Jackie Farrar, our public relations man, told him, uh, Casey told Jackie, he said, would you do me a favor? Would you send a telegram back to this kid in the Army? And, and Jackie Farrar said, well, what do you want me to say? He says, if you're so damn smart, let me see you get out of the service. <laughs> <laughs> Former Yankee broadcaster Mel Allen recalls Casey's testimony before Congress on the state of baseball in 1958. He is the first and only person to so testify that confused a Senate hearing altogether. And uh, I don't think he stopped for any punctuation marks. It broke up everybody in the audience at the hearing and even some of the senators scratching their heads and wondering, uh, you know, what he was saying. He would use a lot of they and thems, and they didn't know who thems or theys were and all that. Mickey Mantle was called next, and they started asking him how he felt about the situation. He said, I agree with Casey 100%, and that really broke it all up. One of the two teams to beat the Yanks in the series during the decade was the Brooklyn Dodgers. The joy of victory was extra sweet for the bums in 1955 when they topped their crosstown rivals for the first time in six tries. Johnny Padres winds in the pitch to Howard. Ground ball is short. Could be it. Dee Wee Reese throws. And the Brooklyn Dodgers are the 1955 world champions. The bums don't have to say wait till next year. I'm just happy as I can't say a word. No kidding. Hey, Craig. Been waiting a long time for it. Finally made it. Johnny Padres, obviously long live Padres. Finally get that race. Yeah. Gil, you drove in both the runs today. How do you feel? Oh, just great. Uh, so happy I can't explain it to you right now. We just uh, we've been waiting uh, so long for one of these to happen, and it's finally arrived. And uh, I just can't believe it yet. That's all. And uh, this look to you. Uh, I can't say words to express just how good he was. He was great. And then celebration broke out and I'm telling you I've never seen anything like it uh, and uh, and I possibly never will see anything <laughs> like it again uh, the town of New York it was like like the end of World War II all over again when we took our buses back to Brooklyn and went through New York City and it was a, a ticker tape parade in the whole bit The following year, the ticker tape parade moved cross town to the Bronx as the Yanks avenged their loss to the Dodgers in seven games. In game five of the Fall Classic, virtual unknown Don Larson pitched the one and only perfect game in World Series history for the Yankees in their 2-0 victory. The man who caught Larson's gem was Hall of Famer Yogi Berra. Yogi's two home runs in Game 7 of the series helped clinch the Yankees' fourth world title of the decade, and the Dodgers could do nothing but marvel at the feats of number eight. I don't know what I'm laughing about, to tell you the truth, but uh, the Yogi here, uh, the way I feel about it, had it not been for him, Nuke probably would have been in there a little longer because he certainly was throwing as, as well as I've ever seen him throw. And this guy here, to me, is just the finest clutch hitters I've ever seen in the game today of uh, baseball. He does a tremendous job. What's your reaction to this, Yogi? Well, I was very thrilled, but, uh, you know, with these Brooklyn Dodgers, that five run wasn't even safe. Uh, safe. I was glad when Skyron hit that home run with the bases loaded. 1955 would be the last time the Boys of Summer would bring a world title to Brooklyn. 
Three years later, both the Dodgers and Giants packed their bags and headed to California. Duke Snyder remembers saying goodbye to Ebbets Field. We hated to leave. I hated to leave. It was, it was a very sad occasion because we loved Brooklyn. wife and I, uh, when we saw this, this uh, demolition crew knocking down the right field fence in Ebbets Field with this great big steel ball going into that fence where I had hit line drives into that fence myself, and watching that fence crumble, why we both had tears in our eyes. As baseball expanded to the West Coast, the game itself was growing and expanding on the field. The 1960s ushered in an era of speed and pitching, replacing the power-oriented game prevalent since the days of Babe Ruth. One player who epitomized the new running game was Maury Wills, the speed demon of the Los Angeles Dodgers. Wills tore up National League base paths, stealing a then-record 104 bases in 1962. Maury's success did not deter the opposition from trying to slow him down, however. And the Braves came up with the best thing. And Joe Torre was a catcher first baseman. Uh, I came sliding in, hit first when I had my maximum lead. Right. So the first baseman flopped down in front of me, and I come back hit first, I'm vulnerable. I can't get to the base. Right. And then he catch the ball and tag me out. That worked better than any trick they had at first base. Better than the sand, better than the water the Giants uh -huh. put down. And so I said, well, I complained to the umpire, and the umpire said, no, you got it. Fans would start booing me in Milwaukee. I said, okay. So I got off the team bus on the way back to the hotel the next day, huh. that night rather, right. and I went to a hardware store. I got me a file. So I'm sitting on the edge of my bed and I'm filing my spikes. I brought home in a paper bag. My roommate, Willie Crawford, had a high pitched voice. Romeo, what are you doing? I said, I'm filing my spikes. He said, what are you doing that for? I said, you saw what happened tonight. I went out there the next day, there goes Joe down again, blocking the base. Uh -huh. He went down with the leg, and I came back feet first. Wham! And he jumped up just in time, and I hit those big pillow bags we had. Right, we didn't right. have these little bags with the spikes, uh -huh. pegs on them. And the stuffing came out of the bag when I pulled my spikes out. Joe looked at me, he looked down at the base, and the stuffing, he got the idea. Will suffered one of the biggest disappointments of his career when he was traded from the Dodgers in 1966. Maury's heart was always in Los Angeles, and when he returned to the team three years later, it was as if a prodigal son had come home. So they traded me back to the Dodgers, and Walter O'Malley again, the man that moved the Dodgers from Brooklyn to Los Angeles, came to the clubhouse. They tell me the only time which was to see me back. See, my life is being a Dodger. I, I used to drink over not being with the Dodgers after my playing days. That's how much it meant to me to be a Dodger. Today, I am a Dodger. In fact, I've always been a Dodger, but I'm official with Dodger. One of the dominant pitchers of the 1960s was Bob Gibson, the fireballing hurler of the St. Louis Cardinals. Gibson excelled not just on the diamond, but on the hardwood as well, and he once considered giving up baseball for basketball. When I first went up, I was a little unhappy with baseball, and I thought I would quit and and try to play basketball. Uh, Solly Hemus was the manager at the time, and he didn't think that much of my ability. And when Johnny Keene took over in 1961, the day he took over, he told me I was going to be his fourth starter, and I was going to be out there win, lose, or draw, and that really did a lot for my confidence. Any pitcher appreciates a good defense behind him, and Brooks Robinson was the defensive whiz of the decade for the Baltimore Orioles. His plays at third base have become the stuff of legend, his skills weren't all inherent, however. A part-time job that he held as a youngster helped him strengthen his throwing arm. I started uh, working on my arm many years ago back in Little Rock when I used to go by a fellow by the name of Bill Dickey, the great oh, yeah, catcher Yankee for the New York man. Yankees. He was on my uh, paper route. I used to flip a paper, and most of the time I'd be on the roof. So my arm started getting a little stronger a long time ago. <laughs> With Brooks patrolling the hot corner, the Orioles won two world titles. These guys played some serious ball, but they also knew how to have fun. Witness the kangaroo court the players introduced in the team clubhouse in 1969. 
It was uh, kind of something to relieve the tension or help bring the guys a little closer because we hadn't won in several years, and it really turned out to be a bonanza for the whole ball club. And we only held the court after each winning game. And Frank Robinson was the judge. He had a mop, uh, uh, the mop part of it you put over your head to look like a judge. And um, we found he uh, he would call the uh, the court to order and. He would find guys for missing a sign or maybe making a base running blunder, and we had about four or five articles that we passed out. But it was all done in good taste, and uh, all the fines that were collected during the year were passed out to a charitable organization uh -huh. at the end of the year. But we had a good time, and it really seemed to bring us a little closer. The field general for these great Oriole teams was Earl Weaver. As the O's manager, Weaver won four American League pennants and a World Series. But one thing he never won was an argument with an umpire. Earl's confrontations with the men in blue were legendary, like the time in Minnesota when he got caught smoking a cigarette in the dugout. Bill Heller was at third base, and really, I didn't get ejected for that. Uh, there was, at that time, and there still is, a penalty for smoking in the dugout. I felt that I was far enough down the runway that no cameras or any people could see me especially the people at the ballpark, but Haller was bending around the corner trying to see me as much as he could, and uh, I had had an argument with him earlier in the game, and he said, okay, Weaver, I got you, you know, it's gone, we're going to turn your name in, and the American League is going to find you, which is all true, because that's the way it should be. However, I came out screaming at Haller at that time, and uh, then became ejected. Well, the next day, uh, I had the clubhouse man in Minnesota go out and uh, buy me a pack of candy cigarettes, the chalk kind with the red light. Now, we all know that umpires can't see too well. So when I come walking out of the dugout the next day uh, with the lineup cards to give them to him at home plate, I had one of these little cigarettes sticking out of my mouth. And from home plate, I don't, not just because they're umpires, but nobody could see that it was not a real cigarette at the time. They stopped. They stared at me. When I got up to home plate, I asked them if they wanted a bite, and I ate the cigarette. <laughs> and two of them smiled, but Haller and Newmont did not think it was funny, and I lasted about three innings that day, and I was gone. Along with being one of the more vocal managers of his era, Earl was also one of the most competitive. He was willing to go to any lengths to win ball games. My desires to win stem from one reason. I, like everybody else, have children. Uh, children uh, had to send through college, children that had to be fed every day. I had to have a job to go to every day, and I knew that if I didn't win, we wouldn't have meat and potatoes on the table. I'd be back in the minor leagues, or out selling cars, or back at the moon company. So I thought the best thing that I could do would be uh, concentrate my efforts, any manner, shape, or form that I could to win a ball game, because if I did, the owner would want you back that next day. And if you won enough of them during the course of the year, at the end of the year, he'd say, Earl, would you like to come back next year? <laughs> And then we'd know that we'd be able to eat for another year. Where the Orioles left off in the early 1970s, the Cincinnati Reds picked up. During the 70s, the Big Red Machine won four National League crowns and two world championships. One of their most exciting league titles came in 1972, when they faced the Pittsburgh Pirates in a winner-take-all finale. Reds catcher Johnny Bench recalls his game-tying homer. I walked out into the on-deck circle, and uh, my parents lived in Cincinnati at that time. They would have been there anyway. And they're saying, Johnny, Johnny. And I, you know, I don't look around. I'm trying to concentrate. They say, it's your mother. And so I uh, turned around, and here's mom looking at me. And she's got this angelic look on her face. And she's saying, hit me a home run. Pitch to bench, change, hit in the air to deep right field. That goes to Mindy. It's a pitch. She's done. I never hit home runs right field. I've always been a pull hitter, and I was. Uh, it was a rarity. I mean, something nobody could believe. And then just, I got chills from it. It was probably one of the most exciting things ever happened in my life. Another vital cog in the Reds' machine was Joe Morgan, the Hall of Fame second baseman, who had nothing but high praise for his former all-star teammates. I was fortunate because I got to play with some of the greatest players to ever play this game. And uh, some of these guys, there won't be any more Pete Roses, for instance, or probably Johnny Benches, or Tony Perez. You know, I think those three guys, I guess, stand out in my mind more than the rest because I think they were just special people. And they, the guys like that come along once every 100 years. Uh, obviously, they all know about Pete Rose and what he's accomplished in this game. But I think the thing that 
Pete represents most to me is not all the statistics, all the hits or anything like that, but the intensity with which he played the game. Uh, every day was like the opening day of a World Series to Pete Rose, and only Pete Rose. No other player, myself included, any player I've ever seen, had that type of intensity. I mean, every day was like the first day of the World Series. Johnny Bench, for instance, to me was probably more physically gifted than any of the players on that ball club. He had great hands, huge hand size. He could do things with the catcher's mitt that no other catcher could do. He could use it like a first baseman's glove. So he had talent that no one else would ever have. Uh, to be a great hitter, you either have to be very quick with the bat or very strong. Johnny Bench had both. Very few people have that. Tony Perez, I think, was a quiet guy on the ball club. He was a, he was a quiet leader, uh, but he was as much a part of that team and probably maybe a little more important than a lot of people ever gave him credit for. He's the only guy of the four of us that never uh, won a Most Valuable Player Award, and I, and I really feel bad for that because he was just as valuable to our ball club as any of the rest of the guys. So those three guys really mean a lot to me. Uh, and when I think about them, you know, I get a warm feeling inside because they are special to me and they represent a special time in my life. The story of the Big Red Machine is one of success and triumph. Unfortunately, not all of baseball's grand stories have happy endings. One of the most difficult tasks for an athlete to perform is to retire from the sport which made him famous. Roberto Clemetti never got that chance. On New Year's Eve 1972, Clemetti was killed in a plane crash while flying to Nicaragua to help earthquake victims there. At his funeral, number 21 was remembered not just for his baseball greatness, but also for his great human kindness. We remember his vitality, his grace, his agility, his exuberance on the playing field where he was so thrilling to watch. You chose to bring to a close his life as he attempted to help others to live. We ask that his memory will continue to enliven us in showing proper respect for the precious gift of life in ourselves and our fellow man, wherever he be. Within four years time, baseball also lost to retirement two living legends, Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays. Thank you. When I walked into this stadium, 18 years ago, I felt much the same way I do right now. I don't have words to describe how I felt then or how I feel now, but I'll tell you one thing, baseball was real good to me, and playing 18 years in the Yankee Stadium for you folks is the best thing that could ever happen to a ball player. To think that the Yankees are retiring my number seven with numbers three, four, and five tops off everything that I could ever wish for. I've often wondered how a, a man who knew he was going to die could stand here and say that he was the luckiest man in the world. But now I think I know how Lou Gehrig felt. This is... Uh, It's been a great honor. I'll never forget it. God bless you all, and thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Willie Mays.
that with my farewell tonight, you would understand what I'm going through right now. Something that I never feel that I would ever quit baseball. But as you know, it always come a time for someone to get out. And I look at the kids over here, the way they are playing, and the way they are fighting for themselves, tells me one thing. Willie, say goodbye to America. Thank you very much. On July 4th, 1939, the baseball world witnessed perhaps its saddest moment. Lou Gehrig, strong and durable in his prime, was dying from a rare muscle disorder. And fans came out en masse to see the Iron Man one last time. Shirley Povich was there. The day was advertised as a tribute to Lou. There was such an outpouring of fans that every seat at Yankee Stadium was filled. And, and, and official after official and player after player of the Yankees came along and spoke into the microphone and spoke of the great affection from Lou and what he meant to them and Lou standing by uh, uh, actually stooped as he was. Uh, uh, I saw that day, if you talk about sadness, in any gathering. That's the day I saw photographers cry. Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. That I might have been given a bad break, but I've got an awful lot to live for. Thank you. Two years later, Lou Gehrig died at the age of 37. As sad as Lou Gehrig's farewell speech was, it is as much a part of the glorious history of baseball as Roger Maris's record-setting 61st home run, or Willie Mays' four-round trippers in one game. The heart and soul of the game lies beyond the box scores and batting statistics. It lies in the words of the storytellers, those who pass on the wonderful tales of pennant races and hitting streaks, clubhouse humor, and post-game celebrations. The stories told here today give but a small taste of what baseball has been to America and what it will mean to future generations. Great players come and go, great teams come and go, but the memories, myths, and legends live on forever.